Well, I started with a prayer, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue on with a second prayer. And here's how I want to greet you this morning as I, was, as I was preparing to give this word. I was drawn to Philippians chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 11, and the apostle is praying over the church in Philippi. And I want to pray this over us as I greet you in this new year. But this applies to us as the church. This is a ongoing, everlasting prayer right here for us. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you are all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And it's right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen? You receive that? That's a good prayer, isn't it? I, I like, the, I like that, that, uh, that line where he says, for you are all partakers with me of grace. Say partakers of grace. I am a partaker of grace. Say that one more time. It is absolutely true, isn't it? And today that's what I want to talk to you about is grace. And I, and I want to come at it from a couple different angles, but we're partakers of grace. And then he goes on to say, he prays for us that we would be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus. We, we're looking at a new year. We're going into a new year and and uh, I, I am quite certain the Lord will give us points of emphasis for this year as he, as he often does. But, but this morning, <clears throat> I want to remind you of the mission that we're already on. Excuse me. Because how many of you guys know that God's desire is that he can complete the good work that he's begun in each of us. That each new year doesn't bring a new mission. It doesn't bring a new vision in that sense. We're part of the overall vision in Christ Jesus. The fullness of his kingdom, the fullness of his promises, the fullness of everything that Christ gave his life for, everything that was dreamed in the Father's heart. That's what we're a part of. And this prayer is just, is just such a beautiful picture of that, isn't it? Partakers of grace, that we would be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus and he's faithful to complete that good work that he's begun in each of us. What an incredible promise. Now, I have to tell you, uh, well, I don't have to tell you, but I'm going to. I'm gonna tell you this has been a really challenging season for me and I'm gonna touch on that a little bit today, but I was, I was lamenting, my personality type is that if I'm not like on then I feel like I'm losing. Like if I'm not abounding in joy and hope, I feel like I am just losing like under a lake somewhere. Not everybody's wired like that, but for me, I either want to win big or I'm losing. Are you with me? It's just my personality type. It's just, that's how it feels. When I get tired, I think there's a crisis. Like I get worried like, oh no, I don't have any strength. How will I, how will I encourage people? How will I fix things? How will I do stuff if, I, if, I'm, not, if I'm not up? If I don't have what it takes, there's no fuel in the tank. And I think, I feel like it's a real personal crisis. And then I go lay down for like 10 minutes and I get back up and I'm like, oh, the Lord has saved everyone again. This is amazing. It's a huge shift. Something profound has happened. And that's just, that's partially just how that I'm wired. But as I said, this has been a really challenging year. 23 has been a very challenging year year for me. And I, and I have to tell you, I confess, I confess to you that I have not been always on my A game every moment. I mean, of course, here on Sundays, I've been amazing. No one's disputing that, but most of all me, I'm just, I'm joking. You probably noticed, but don't tell me if you did, but it's been a challenging year. It's been a challenging year. And as I was going through that, I was thinking about how 
how I've been concerned because as I'm going through this year, I've had a concern for the people that are in my life, starting with my own kids and with those that are closest to me that count on me, my wife and my kids. And, and I've thought, Lord, what am I going to do when they look at me and they see that, I, that I'm not abounding in joy right now? I'm not, I'm not overflowing with hope right now. I'm not bubbling happiness like how, how I like to do. I'm not, I'm not the normal reflection that I feel like I am. And, and I was getting worried because I'm like, what, you know, what happens when the people that look at me and expect to see something positive and helpful look at me and they're just sort of like, yeesh. <laughs> Nobody else here worries about that? Okay. So, <laughs> and, and the Lord stopped me in that moment and he just said, Joshua, who is in you? And I was like, Lord, you're in me. And he says, that's right. That's right. What you need to remember is that when people look at you and they see something good and they see something helpful, they see something hopeful, it's because you are looking at me and I am reflected in you. When they look in you and they see something beautiful, it's me, Joshua. And you're scared you're going to let people down, but let me tell you something. I'm in you and what people value that they see in you, those good things coming out of you, that is me and I will be with them and I will never let them down. And I got to tell you in that moment, that was life giving. Are you guys with me? That, that was, it was like a billion pounds because I'm that important. I'm just kidding went off of my shoulders of false responsibility to somehow try to be strong all the time, to somehow try to be encouraging all the time, be anointed all the time, be up all the time, be able to be abounding, if you will, right? All the time. And because I don't want to let anybody down. I don't want you to like look at my life and be like, man, it doesn't seem like that kingdom stuff is working too good. Does anybody ever worry about that? It's like, don't look at my life right now. It's not a good moment. But here's the thing, it's Jesus in me. He's the hero in the story. I was sharing with Jason, I said, you know, I feel like I've been practicing shrinking lately. I've been the hero in my story. I didn't realize that was what was going on, but I've been judging myself as the hero in the story. And number one, it's crushing. But number two, it's, it's well, actually, there's no number two. It's just crushing. But if he's the hero in the story... Then suddenly it gets exciting because he's carrying it and he won't let me down. I let me down. I let you down. But he won't let either of us down. And, and what's amazing, and I mean, I just love these songs that we sang today. It was a meditation on what you're going to hear again through this message. But he's the hero. He's the one that's going to complete the good work that he's begun in each of us. He's the one that's extended grace to us, right? We are partakers of a grace, and our hero, Jesus, is the one that gave that grace to us. Our good father gave us Jesus, the hero, and he's come, and here we are, partakers of grace. Amen? And so I want to talk to you about that. What's that look like in real time? What does that look like in real time? Well, if you'll go with me here, I'm going to stretch an analogy just a little bit. I'm going to use scripture to church it up so it'll be okay. <laughs> I'm funny to me sometimes. I'm just letting you down. But he's a hero, and his jokes always land. In Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, this is the story of when Moses sees the burning bush. And I'm just going to read this to you. And then I'm going to stretch this analogy for you, and hopefully you'll go with me on this. Now, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. I think Jason just preached on this recently. Um, or no, I don't remember. Stay on standpoint, Joshua. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, and yet it was not consumed. Bushes on fire. Not that unusual out in the hot, hot, hot desert that a bush is on fire. Has anybody ever been like, is that a campfire over there? I'm going to go check it out. Like, we've all seen campfires. You're going to go check out a campfire. A bush is on fire. The reason why Moses looked at it, though, is it says he beheld the bush was burning, and yet it wasn't consumed. And Moses said, I'm going to turn aside to see this great sight, why this bush is not burned. Not why is it on fire, 
That's usual. But why is it not burned? Why isn't it being consumed? And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And then he said, don't come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Which, by the way, when we were singing that song earlier, as Tyler was leading us, I was like, oh, we're going to be using this scripture. I'm really excited. You didn't know that, but I did. And now you know. He goes over to this bush that is burning but is not consumed And he's wondering, why is this thing not getting burned up? It's not unusual for something to be on fire, but it's very unusual for it to not get consumed. And when he took notice of it, what did he discover? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the midst of that fire, in the midst of that bush. Now, here's what I'd like to say. This is what grace looks like in our lives. You and I are regular bushes. And you know what? You're going to get burned. Yeah, happy new year. Fire is usual. It's going to happen. Some of you are on fire right now. And not the good Holy Ghost kind, the fun kind. You've got things going on in your life. But grace through Christ in you causes you to not be consumed when you're on fire. And when people look at you, Now, go with me on this analogy, but when they look at you and they go, yeah, it's normal for people to, boy, you are in the midst of that. That's terrible. I'm just glad it's not me. What's happening in your life right now? But then they take a closer look and they're like, why aren't you consumed? Why why are you, wait a minute, hold on. You're still standing. Hold up. You're still, there's still hope in you. There's still peace in you. There's something going on. And when we take a closer look, then we see the hero of the story. Are you guys with me? We see Jesus. We see the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We look. See, this is how grace works in our lives. It's not that you don't go through the fire. It's not that you don't get lit up sometimes. It's that you don't get consumed because God's grace is in you. God is in you. And his grace sustains you. So, so this is actually the testimony that we have, right? It says, what is this that overcomes the world? Even our faith. That in the midst of it, the grace of God actually extends into our situation, and it makes up the difference between what we can do and what we can't do. You know, there's a, a great scripture Let's read this one together. 2 Corinthians, wait a minute, I don't know if I gave you this one. Yeah, I did. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. Okay. So Paul is speaking, and he's in the midst of seeing all kinds of amazing things. But at a certain point, after having incredible revelation, this happens. And so we're just going to start right in here as Paul's talking about walking through this life. He says, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations... A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. And three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me for the sake of Christ. Then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, for when I am weak, then I am strong. See, this is what grace looks like. It's, that, it's the difference between what I can do on my own and what God then has to do. You guys have all heard that, that, uh, that saying that gets accredited to a scripture and it's, it's, it's just not in there. It says, God will never give you anything that you can't handle. And that is 100% not true. What it says is <laughs> that he won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able and will extend grace and give you a way to resist temptation. He'll give you a way out of the temptation. It does not say that he won't give you something that you can't handle. He gives you things that you can't handle all the time. 
This life, has anybody been alive for more than eight minutes? This is a hard place to be. But here's what he does say. My grace is sufficient for you. You see, grace in action is the difference between what you and I can do naturally and then what is actually needed for us to not be consumed by the fire we're in. Are you with me? It's the strength that God adds where our strength runs out. That's what grace is, and that is available to us. And in fact, I don't know about you guys. Are there any perfectionists in the house? Oh, my people. I know, right? You got a list of all the things I could have said better. The misquotes. This face. Anyway. And our goal as perfectionists is this. One of these days, we're going to get there. We're just going to get there. We realize the Messiah was needed, but if he can just get a few people to just get it right, then y'all will see it, and then you'll start getting it right, and then the world will finally get it right. Amen? Amen, perfectionists? Here's the problem. That ain't happening until Jesus comes and creates the new heaven and the new earth. Now, there are a lot of good things that are happening. But that perfectionist dream, that performance dream is not going to happen. But that is okay because Jesus said, I'm going to complete the good work that I've begun in each of you. And my grace is sufficient for you. So no, I'm not going to remove your weakness, Joshua Rivas. I'm not going to remove that weakness. In fact, in your weakness, my grace is going to be glorifying who my father is, who I am. My grace is going to be sufficient. In your weakness, Joshua, God's strength is going to be made perfect. Are you with me? And that's your story too. He's saying, I want people to look at your life and see what I'm doing. What a huge relief. I know a lot of you guys are not as stubborn as me, so you probably already figured this out. And you're not on this constant pursuit to try to do it all in your own strength so that everything will finally work. But some of us need to remember <laughs> that it's his grace that carries us through. This has been a hard year as I started to share. And I asked Karen if I could share a little bit with you. I won't beleaguer this too much, but as you know, she printed up a little bit about it, but she came down with a neurological disorder that affects her brain and her nervous system. And so what will happen is if there's too much stimuli, and you know, Jack, you, you probably know what I'm talking about here. If there's too much stimuli, it begins to affect her body. And in her case, it affects her body with a whole bunch of pain. So she has all this misfiring that happens in her neck and her back. And so without Botox shots to neutralize the movement, then her head shakes like this. So before she took Botox, which she has to take now every 90 days for the rest of her life or unless the Lord heals her, otherwise her head just does this all the time. And like, like if something happens, even at this point, like something major happens, like if I run a power drill and it's like, then she'll like start shaking for a little bit until it calms down. If she, like if something spooks her, then then what will happen, she talks about it, she goes, it's like fire runs through her back because her nervous system responds and misfires all the muscles. And so then she takes Botox, which is great. It helps to neutralize it a little bit. But at night, she has to take muscle relaxers so that she can sleep. And then we wake up several times a night, and I put this stuff called Deep Blue. And if you uh, want to have the greatest um, muscle rub that's out there, it's made by doTERRA, and you can talk to Shannon back there. That stuff, I'm going to buy stock because we just put that stuff on her all the time, and it helps. But here's the reason why that, that she needs it all the time is because the other muscles are trying to compensate for the misfiring muscles. So she's just in constant pain all the time. So she's, it's just this brand new awesome fire that landed on our life. So our, our bush is on fire. And then here's the wild part, though is that in that, it has affected everything that we do. Karen and I's favorite things to do together is projects. 
and she can't do projects with me anymore because power tools and any of that noise causes her to be in constant pain. So it just overwhelms her senses. And so like when she's in crowds like this now, she wears like some little ear, earplug type things to help calm things down. I'm not going to go on and on, but it's, it's, it's like our whole life just changed this year. And, and then also it's affects sleep. <laughs> and as I shared with you, I'm not the same guy when I don't get enough sleep, probably the same with you guys. But here's the thing. As we're going through this, his grace is making up the difference between what we can do. And I, I know each of you has your stories. I'm just sharing our current story. That's, you know, I know, I know many of you in here are facing tremendous things. And the reason why we're both sitting here right now, the reason why we're both not only surviving, but, but we're sustained is because of the grace of God. It's his grace. It makes up the difference between what we can do and what he does. And, and you know what the cool thing about grace is? Is it makes up that difference no matter what it is. Sometimes I'm out of strength and I just need 5% more. But I don't have it. And grace, the grace, the presence, the power, the sustaining living power of the Holy Spirit in me gives me that 5% that I need. And hope stays and, and, and encouragement stays. And, and maybe it's that he helps me to go to sleep instead of worrying. And I'm like, man, but I don't have that 5%. Lord, help me. And, he's, and he physically and spiritually and emotionally comes in and I'm able to go to sleep instead of worrying. And I needed that 5%. But sometimes, you guys know, you need 5 million percent. How many of you guys have been there, right? Where your heart is just like, I can't do this. I can't do this. I was talking to somebody once and they said, if this thing happens, I don't know how I'm going to keep my faith. And I said to them, because of what God is doing, it's not that you'll keep your faith, it's that your faith will keep you. That's the grace. He's completing the good work that he's begun in each of us. His grace makes it possible. It's not hyperbole. It's not, a, it's not just a principle. It's not just something written. It's the physical manifestation of the presence of God in the midst of the fire that causes us to be able to sustain what he's doing. Are you with me? And sometimes you just need 1%, and sometimes you need all of it. But that's the amazing thing about his grace. And as we go through this year, and you know what, guys? This is going to be a wild year, isn't it? I know it feels like we've been in an election year for the last four years, but this is an actual election year. And you know what? We're going to need some grace to walk through that because how many, people, how many of you guys know that there's like one of the major things people use to sell is fear, but his grace is greater than that fire, amen? And he's going to sustain us through that. He's going to sustain us through hard conversations and all the things we need to do. But he's with us. And he's going to complete the good work. And we're going to stay right on track with what he's already doing for his kingdom to come and his will to be done and for people to meet him and to see him and to live forever. Because how many of you know this is a temporary season? But we need his grace to walk through that, don't we? And, and, and so this... This day and this year and always, I want for each of us, here's what I want for each of us. I, I hope that this is like painting a vision in real time for each of us to go, God, have I forgotten that I need your grace? Have I been trying to get strong so that I don't need you anymore? Have I been trying to arrive? I talked about perfectionism. It's like this idea of like, I mean, how many of us, right, are dreaming about that everybody we love is healthy, right? And, and loves Jesus. And, and, and they're, they got a good job and they, they're investing and they're thinking about the retirement and they've got some health care, but they don't even need it. Their relationships are going good. Communication is good. And we're just going to keep going. How many of you want that? Yeah. And, and, and here's the other thing, right? Is the more people you know, the more the percentage is that there's somebody you love that that's not happening for. And so we're just like, man, I'm just, I'm just waiting until this thing happens and then all the good things are going to happen. Well, they're not. They're not all going to happen until Jesus comes. So we're always going to need grace. 
We're always going to need that, that we need God to make up that difference because in this world, we're going to have trouble. In this world, we're going to have fire. In this world, we're going to have pending things. Are you with me? So if we're waiting around until we're strong enough, smart enough, good enough, prayed enough, fasted enough, gave enough, we're healthy enough, discipled enough, worked enough, whatever enough, and then finally I can, whew, okay, here we are. That is not going to happen until our hero Jesus comes back and says, enough. But until that day, it's his grace that's sustaining us. And I want us to lay hold of that, like the apostle is is, is saying to us, I pray for you as partakers of that same grace that you would grow in that love, that you would grow and let that grace sustain you. Are you guys with me? I want us to let go of these pursuits of doing anything in our own strength and give ourselves permission to say, Lord, I'm asking for your grace right now in this conversation. I'm asking for your grace right now in listening to Josh preach this sermon. I'm asking for your grace in my marriage, in my job, in my health, whatever it is, the pain that you're enduring. His grace is sufficient to walk you through this painful moment. Are you with me? And he also gives treasure in the midst of it, but that's a different sermon. But I do, are you guys, are you able to receive this? All right, so I want to give you, I want to give you a couple more thoughts here and then we're going to pray. I think a great picture of this as it happens is from a, an, an old story, and many of you are familiar with this. You probably saw it at your grandma's house at some point, right? But maybe there's some youngins, and this is the first time you've heard it. But here's what it is. One night I had a dream. This is a, I'm going to read it, and then you guys are going to pick it up as it goes for those of you that know it. And others, you'll be like, that's amazing. I never heard that. But this is what grace looks like. One night I had a dream. I dreamed I was walking along the beach with the Lord. And across the sky flashed scenes from my life. And for each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonged to me and the other to the Lord. When the last scene of my life flashed before us, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. And I noticed that many times along the path of my life, there was only one set of footprints. And I also noticed that it happened at the very lowest and saddest times in my life. And this really bothered me, and I, I questioned the Lord about it. Lord, you said that once I decided to follow you, you would walk with me all the way. But I have noticed that during the more troublesome times in my life, there is only one set of footprints. And I don't understand why in times when I needed you the most, you should leave me. And the Lord replied, my precious, precious child, I love you. And I would never never leave you during your times of trial and suffering. When you saw only one set of footprints, that is when I carried you. This is grace. Are you with me? See, there's, there's those times where we're like, God, I don't know how I'm going to make it through another day. And you feel like he's not there, but I'm telling you that because you are not consumed is because he's there. The fact that you haven't given up is because he's carrying you. He might be carrying you right now. There's people in this room right now. I know he's carrying you right now. He's carrying me in a lot of ways right now. I try to help the people I love. I can't help the person I love the most right now. Oh! But his grace is sufficient for me. And he's sufficient for you. And so I want us to lay hold of the grace that is ours. And I want to invite you to rediscover that he is an ever-present help in your time of need right now. I want us this year to presently say, Lord, I don't want to go into this meeting right now because I don't know what to say. Give me grace. Lord, my marriage is stuck, and I'm not sure what to do. Will you come into this place and begin to bring what only you can do? Lord, will you let your grace come into this situation? Be with me in the fire, Lord. Bring your grace into this area. Will you guys be specific with me this year to remember that we are partakers of grace? I want to pray this over you.
over all of us. I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I love being partnered with you, saints. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Do you hear that? Let your soul hear that. He will complete the good work he began in you. He will sustain you. He will continue. His Holy Spirit is working, and he will never, ever stop. You will finish well. Christ is in you, and he is the hero, and he will complete it. It's right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And the church said, amen. amen. I'd like to ask the, uh, the uh, home group leaders and the elders to come forward. We want to take time to minister to you in this new Sunday of the first Sunday of the, of the new year. And we want to bless you in your ministry and your assignment. God bless you and keep you. Cause his face to shine upon you. May he give you favor and shalom. I love you guys.